She bought a red brick house with white columns on the porch. Learning that it had been built by a man named Mr. Hull, she named it Hull House. There, poor people could find a supportive place to live. But also, much more. They could learn to speak English, get care for their children, take painting lessons, go to a concert, exercise in a gym, or act on a stage. These were personal freedoms that middle-class Americans took for granted, but that poor people had rarely been privileged to pursue. Jane Addams started clubs so working boys and girls could have fun and learn too. And she convinced Chicago to build its first public playground. Over the years, she became the best-known reformer of her day. Middle-class reformers like Adams actually, instead of just trying to assist people from afar, went into these communities and lived among the poor. Adams was a crusader throughout her life. She was a pioneer of the idea that the government ought to step in and guarantee higher wages for people and better working conditions and old age pensions. She really was one of those people trying to expand the boundaries of freedom to include the downtrodden who were uh, excluded from it. In 1931, late in her long life, Jane Addams became the first woman ever to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. It was another mighty victory in the story of freedom in America. A visitor once called Jane Addams the only saint the United States has produced. What she was, was a compassionate, educated human being who decided to do something to better the lives of the downtrodden. She demonstrated how one person really can make a difference. I'm Katie Couric. Join me again for Freedom, A History of Us. The United States is hurtling into the modern age, symbolized by megacities rising up all across the continent. By 1909, Americans are spending nearly $23 billion a year on ready-made clothes. This factory is producing 12,000 garments a week, known as shirtwaists, with the latest fashion for the working woman. New York City, March 25th, 1911. 4.45 p.m., the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, 8th floor. 260 girls work here, most of them teenagers. Someone, we don't know who, tosses a match or maybe a cigarette into the scrap bin. Eva Harris, a seamstress, smells burning. There's a fire, Mr. Bernstein. Production manager Samuel Bernstein grabs one of the three fire pails. But the fire is already spreading. There's a mad dash for the exit, but it is too narrow. Only one at a time can pass through. 
It's been designed that way so their bags can be checked for stolen fabric. There's a fire hose, but it's not working. No water! The only way to warn the floors above is through the switchboard two floors up on the 10th floor. Hello, switchboard. 10th floor. Fire. There is a fire. Put me through to the 9th floor. Hello. She drops the phone and runs to get help. The message never reaches the ninth floor. Samuel Bernstein races up the main stairs to help the 160 workers trapped there. But blocking the front door, there's a barrel of motor oil. On the ninth floor, flames are already shooting through the walls and windows. The girls on nine rush to the fire escape, but it's locked. Only two escape routes are left on the ninth floor. The elevator and the metal fire escape. Kate Weiner makes it to the elevator door, but she's lost her sister. Everyone was knocking and crying for the elevator to come up. Suddenly, the elevator came and the girls rushed in. I was searching for my sister Rose, but I couldn't find her. The flames were coming toward me, and I was being left behind. I felt the elevator was leaving the ninth floor for the last time. She's the last person to get to the last elevator. More than 100 girls are left behind to die. The only escape route left is the metal fire escape, but it collapses. Firemen arrive with the biggest ladder in New York City. But it's 30 feet too short. Four fifty-eight p.m. The girls trapped on the ninth floor are out of options. In desperation, they jump. Five fifteen p.m. The entire blaze is over in less than half an hour. 146 people die in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. There's a trial, but the owners walk free. It remains the deadliest workplace disaster in New York City history until September 11, 2001. But some good does come out of it. This dramatic tragedy sparks a wave of reform. So you begin to get new restrictions uh, and a new conversation about uh, what to do to prevent this kind of tragedy from happening. But uh, it did not stop, of course, that tragedy itself. Unions force management to take responsibility for the lives of their workers. The life safety code now used in all 50 states is a direct result of this fire. It's why doors now open outwards in public buildings. Why automatic sprinkler systems or multiple exits are now the law. The U.S.
Nothing so needs reforming as other people's habits. Fanatics will never learn that, though it be written in letters of gold across the sky. It is the prohibition that makes anything precious. Mark Twain The only way to solve the problem of drunkenness many believed was to get rid of the saloon. When I went to Medicine Lodge, Kansas, there were seven dives where drinks were sold. I began to ask why should we have the saloon when Kansas was a prohibition state and our constitution made it a crime to manufacture, barter, sell, or give away intoxicating drinks. These dive keepers really were not as much to blame as the city officials who were in league with this lawless element and could see the wicked walking on every side and the vilest men exalted. Carry Nation. Carrie Nation's life was filled with tragedy. Her mother died in an insane asylum, convinced she was Queen Victoria. Her first husband drank himself to death. A second unhappy marriage would end in divorce. She determined to give herself over to the struggle against what she called the place where the serpent drink crushed the hopes of my early years, the saloon. Kansas had already banned the sale of alcohol in every one of its 105 counties, but the state's dusty cow towns and large cities alike were filled with thirsty men, and no one paid much attention to the law. As president of the Barber County WCTU, Cary Nation had led peaceful marches that had had little effect, wrote letters to legislators and lawmen that were never even answered and eventually became convinced God wished her to do more. On the 6th of June, 1900, before retiring, I threw myself downward at the foot of my bed and told the Lord to use me in any way to suppress the dreadful curse of liquor. I told him I wished I had a thousand lives, that I would give him all of them. And I wanted him to make it known to me some way the next morning, before I awoke, I heard these words very distinctly. Go to Kiowa, and I'll stand by you. The next morning, with an armload of what she called smashers, rocks and bottles wrapped in paper to look like harmless packages, she strode into a saloon in Kiowa. I told the owner, Mr. Dobson, get out of the way. I don't want to strike you, but I'm going to break up this den of ice. I began to throw at the mirror and the bottles below the mirror. Mr. Dobson and his companion jumped into a corner, seemed very much terrified. From that, I went to another saloon until I had destroyed three the other dive keepers closed up, stood in front of their places, and would not let me in. By this time, the streets were crowded with people. One boy, about 15 years old, seemed perfectly wild with joy. I have since thought of that being a significant sign, for to smash saloons will save the boy. She dared the sheriff to arrest her. He did not. She moved on to Wichita to attack the most opulent saloon in town, the bar in the Hotel Cary. When a policeman arrested her there for defacing property, she shouted at him, I am defacing nothing. I am destroying. You put me in here a cub, she said from behind bars, but I will go out a roaring lion, and I will make all hell howl. Her exploits were front-page news. Hundreds of congratulatory telegrams arrived from all over the country. As soon as she got out, she attacked another saloon, this time with the weapon that would become her symbol, a hatchet. Jailed and released once more, she moved on to the town of Enterprise, did further damage there, and then appeared in Topeka, 
the state capital and home to dozens of flourishing saloons, all of them illegal. The leaders of the Topeka WCTU declared themselves not in accord with her methods. I tell you, ladies, she answered, you don't know how much joy you will have until you begin to smash, smash, smash. The governor implored her not to do any more damage. She told him that if he didn't enforce the law, she had no choice. You are a woman, he said and a woman must know a woman's place. She walked out of his office and called for a hatchetation. Many Kansans believed Nation was at least half mad, but hundreds of women and a smaller number of men rallied to her, bringing their own stones and bricks, sticks and hatchets, and calling themselves the Home Defenders Army. Proprietors of the local saloons tried and failed to stop them. She and her followers tore apart a joint favored by state legislators called the Senate, then went on to smash a second bar, a barn filled with saloon fixtures and a warehouse stacked high with barrels of beer. That day, Carrie Nation was jailed and released four times. Within the month, her admirers would attack more than 100 saloons in at least 50 Kansas towns. Anxious state legislators rushed through a bill to strengthen enforcement of the law and pacify her and her home defender's army. It was a remarkable victory. Carrie Nation hoped her movement would spread across the country and sweep away all of the nation's saloons. But once again, like the woman's crusade, it died almost as quickly as it had arisen. Carrie Nation never stopped crusading, in saloons and churches, lecture halls, even on the vaudeville stage. For many, she became a figure of fun, even ridicule. But so long as she lived, bartenders never stopped keeping a wary eye out for her and her dreaded hatchet. Every movement needs some people to call attention to itself by bold action. She knew that uh, you had to draw attention and you needed the press following you. You had to make the right enemies. I don't think she's at all representative of the movement. She's simply uh, the one who called attention to it. And then patient, hardworking people followed through. One of the first moments where Du Bois comes onto the national stage uh, is the brewing controversy uh, between his ideas about racial progress and how to move the race forward and the leading African-American figure of that time period, the late 19th and early 20th century, Booker T. Washington. In the beginning, they agreed on many points about the importance of education and moving the race forward. It turns out, though, that because Du Bois was northern born and had access to some of the best schools in New England and really was encouraged to think broadly, it's been part of his elite graduate education being trained in Berlin, working with Max Weber. By contrast to Booker T. Washington, who was self-educated, a very gifted and talented man, uh, but he was born as a slave. That 
fundamental difference certainly shaped their sense of change over time. The life that Booker T. Washington eventually led as the leading, most recognized figure of African American society meant that his expectations for what the white race was willing to do on behalf of black people were very different than of Du Bois. You could say Du Bois was a utopian idealist in some respects, and Booker T. Washington was a pragmatist better known as an accommodationist. And so it, it set up an ongoing debate. Eventually, Booker T. Washington's program sustained the ethos of Jim Crow America because it was about black people working, but on white people's terms. It was about a lack of political enfranchisement because black people were subject to poll taxes and literacy tests and the inability to vote. And it was ultimately about a form of second-class citizenship that was segregated America. In this regard, Du Bois did see that real change, fundamental change, living up to the real promises of racial democracy in America, depended upon agitation, depended upon a grasp for power.